Hi, everyone. I am Pastor Garrett, and I want to welcome you here to worship at Christ Lutheran Church Online. Uh, happy Memorial Day weekend to you all. Um, as we begin our service this morning, we have just a couple of community updates uh, before we uh, have our opening song together. Uh, the first one, this is kind of the question that is looming over everyone's head, and that question is, when will we be back in the sanctuary, that is? Um, and I just want to encourage you that information about that is coming pretty soon. Um, and by pretty soon, I mean this week. I want you to keep your eyes peeled for information regarding that. That doesn't mean there are going to be real specific dates, um, but there will be a plan at least in place so that um, as things progress, we will be uh, back together as soon as we pr uh, possibly can. Uh, the only other update that I'll have for you is that next Sunday, a week from today, is in fact Pentecost Sunday. Uh, so highly encourage you to join us for that. Um, if you'd like to, the tradition typically is to wear red on Pentecost Sunday as uh, symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So as a family or even just on your own watching it, um, highly encourage to wear red. That'll be our last uh, weekend in the sermon series on the Holy Spirit in particular. So uh, we planned it that way so that we can look at the Spirit's work in preparation for Pentecost. Uh, so with that, we hope uh, today's service is a blessing to you. We'll start today uh, by praying together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, by your Holy Spirit, draw us into the life of Christ. God, free us from every sin. Deliver us from every distraction. And give us the joy of Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
is Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is in all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup, and you hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places indeed. I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Both seize your power, spirit of joy. 
Now, when the disciples saw that Jesus was leaving, they were sad and they were sad and beyond belief. Imagine your best friend moving away somewhere far, maybe like even Thailand, and you have no idea where Thailand even is, and you've got to find a map to go look at it. Some of you are learning your countries, and maybe you know where it is, but maybe some of you don't, and it's really tricky. So the disciples felt like this. They felt like their best friend was leaving, and they didn't know what to do. They were so, so, so sad. And Jesus told them, it's okay to be sad right now, but soon you will understand, and soon you're going to have pure joy. And the disciples were like, what does pure joy even look like? And it's a hard one to think about sometimes, especially when you're so little. Sometimes even when you're big, it's hard to think about. But joy is a feeling inside. It's not happiness. It's not buying the coolest shirt that is out there or the most awesome sneakers that you can find or getting the newest bow for your hair if you're a girl. They're really big and popular right now. Lots of bows around. But pure joy comes from God. Pure joy comes from the Holy Ghost living inside of you. How do you get that? Well, you get to talk to God using the Bible. You get to talk to God um, by praying. Anywhere you go, you can talk to God. It doesn't even matter where you are, what you're doing. You could be at the park playing with your grandma. And right then and there, you can talk to God. You can thank him for making the flowers or the sand. Being in his presence. And putting your faith in knowing that God's promises are real. In Galatians 3.26, he says, For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons and daughters of God through faith. And that is pure, pure joy. Now, we have a little experiment to show you maybe what pure joy could look like. And... I got Hutch and Sophia to do it for you. Enjoy. These vases represent all of us. See, we walk around with this little bit inside of us. But when we get the joy of the Holy Ghost inside of us, talking to Jesus, being in his presence, like singing in the choir, or being an acolyte, or helping with baptisms, going to Sunday school, studying about him with our family, when we do all this, we begin to bubble up over so much. We even make more than we really need. So what should we do with it? We can share God's joy. Whoa, we're bubbling over. Oh, look at that. The blue one's going faster than the red. Whoa, we're sharing it now. Look, let's share it. Let's share God's joy. I'm going to share it with you, Sophia. Ha, it's so bouncy. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them to John chapter 16. And we're going to be starting in verse 16. So Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, A little while and you will see me no longer. And again a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, 
Whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. So I was reading an article this week on what are called positive life events. So these are things that happen that are really good. And so it was saying that we almost always imagine these events are going to make us happy. And yet whenever they happen, there's a particular pattern they follow that leaves us in pretty much the same position as before. So for example, when it comes to getting married, that would be a positive life event. And so leading up to your wedding day, your levels of life satisfaction go up and up and up. But then after your wedding day, For me, they just kept going up, but for everyone else, apparently, they go down. In fact, they eventually get right back to a base level of happiness, the same you had before your wedding day. It's the same with having kids. Leading up to the birth, levels of life satisfaction, they go up, 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 and then the baby is born, down, down, down. Again, right back to that base level of happiness. Winning the lottery sounds amazing, right? And yet people who win the lottery, typically within just a few months, are right back at that base level of happiness. Getting a promotion and therefore making more money, that actually helps. Up to a point of $75,000 salary, after which more money has almost no effect on life satisfaction. And according to the notorious B.I.G., it's just no money, no problem. So there's that too. So here's the thing about this. It seems like each of us has that base level of happiness that positive life events and good circumstances don't affect all that much. And so whereas almost everyone is assuming that someday something will happen to make us happy, it just doesn't work that way. So on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being absolutely miserable and 10 being beatifically happy, almost everyone is stuck perhaps somewhere between a three and a six. And yet throughout Scripture, there is an almost embarrassing amount of talk about joy, overflowing joy. In fact, you could say it's a basic conviction of Christianity that we are counted among the people of God. And we're not faking it like we're pretending, but it's real. We really know the Lord. Then one of the most fundamental features of our life will be joy. In other words, we are going to be happy. It's a promise of God himself. And yet, are we? I'm not so sure. So what I want to do today is I want to look at how the Holy Spirit gives us joy. If you've been with us, we are in week five of a six-week sermon series. And we've been looking at what the Holy Spirit gives us and how he does that. And so today, we're going to look at how the Holy Spirit gives us joy in particular. There are three things that I'll mention. So let me start with the first one. I may introduce it by way of a story of sorts. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, I was a really happy kid. I tend to think most little kids are pretty happy. And for me, a huge part of that was my dad. I just had a great relationship with him. So I really looked up to him. I admired him. I wanted to be him. And so the most important thing in the world to me was my dad's opinion. And what I mean by that is as long as I knew my dad was proud of me, I'd be happy. Nothing else really mattered. And yet at a certain point, this was probably around the age of 13, which for a lot of kids, things start to change at that point. Uh, But for whatever reason, I started thinking other things mattered more. Or perhaps you could say I started thinking other things would make me happier. It was weird. It was like I went from knowing my identity. I was my father's son. That's just who I was. I had a dad who loved me. Nothing else mattered. Two, I didn't really know who I was. So for a couple years, I was trying to be a skater. So at the age of 14, I would be wearing a backwards hat that said adrenaline across the back. I had a shirt that said toy machine. That was like a skateboard company at the time. I'd have size 42-inch pants around the waist. Needless to say, I was incredibly cool. And if you want to take the C in cool and replace it with a T, that might be more accurate. 
But the thing is, I was being fake and trying to fit in. And so as part of that, I was doing all sorts of stuff that I knew my dad would hate. Mind you, not because he would ever hate me, but because he loved me. And you see, there are just some things that a parent will hate. If only because those things could wreck the life of the child that they love. And so what the child does, and this is what I did, is you start hiding stuff. Whereas I still wanted my dad to be proud. That didn't go away. At the same time, I wanted other things too. And so I was living this divided life. In one sense, the stuff I was doing was kind of enjoyable. I kind of liked it. And yet in a deeper sense, it was killing my joy. Why? Because I was hiding. And one thing about hiding is it's a robber of joy. If you can't live openly, it is a robber of joy. And so whereas I was kind of having fun, I was also losing my happiness. I was sort of enjoying myself, but losing my joy. I went from being a simple, innocent kid who always knew that his father loved him to a confused, shady teenager who always wondered what his friends thought. So here's the thing about this. I'm talking a lot about my childhood, but that's not really the point. The point is there's an analogy in the way we we relate to the Lord. In particular, you and I are meant to be like children. So we should care about nothing more than our Father's love, our identity. We have it. It's that we have a Father who loves us. That's it. And so the main goal is just to stay in that love. And yet, for whatever reason... We don't. We tend to think other things are going to make us happier. So at some point, we've all started living for things other than our Father's love. And you see, as part of that, we've started thinking and doing things that we know God hates. And again, not because he hates us. That's never the case, but because he loves us. And you see, when a father loves his child, a creator loves his creation, he will hate whatever might wreck or ruin the life of his children. And so knowing that's the case, we know it, what do we do? We hide it. We hide. It's the same situation I was just describing, where in one sense, the stuff we're doing is enjoyable. No one commits a sin because it's miserable. We do it because we like it. And yet hiding is always a robber of joy. And so even though the sin itself perhaps perhaps makes us momentarily happy, It drains our happiness at the same time. So we're kind of enjoying ourselves, and yet we all know it. We're losing our joy. We've gone from being simple, innocent children of God who who always knew that our Father loved us to confused, shady teenagers. Sorry if you're a teenager, just illustration, not personal. Confused, shady teenagers who aren't really sure about anything. So it's this divided life that we live, and it's not giving us joy. So how does the Spirit give us joy? That's our question. Two things that he does. One is he brings us back into the presence of God. He's the Spirit of truth, is what the Bible calls him. And so all the stuff we've been hiding, he's going to bring it out into the light of God's presence. Which means we're giving it up at that point. You can't bring sin into God's presence and not have it be removed any more than you can bring darkness into the presence of light and not have the darkness go away. So in the Spirit, by the Spirit, we're coming back to the Father who loves us. And so number two, the Spirit's work is to assure us the Father's love never went away. In fact, in the New Testament, Jesus himself is the Father's love. And when it comes to disobedient people, he didn't depart from them. No, he dies for them. And so again, the Father's love never went away. You and me, we just went away. So one of the main ways the Spirit gives us joy is by bringing us back. So in that Psalm 16, which was read earlier in the service, it says at the end, in your presence, in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. And so the Spirit gives us joy by bringing us back into God's loving presence. 
Or maybe you could say he gives us joy by giving us a life lived in God's loving presence instead of that divided, duplicitous life that we've been living in the dark. So let's go to the second way. The Spirit gives us joy. That first one had two points, so maybe you're getting confused. That was just one point, one thing as a whole. So this is the second way the Spirit gives us joy. So I was just talking about going from being a child to being a teen, right? But one step past that, when you graduate high school and go to college, there's a sense in which you go from depending on your parents to depending on yourself. Now, in one sense, that transition is really healthy. Part of growing up is becoming independent. So financially, emotionally, etc., we need to not depend on our parents. So that part is healthy, and yet it can lead to something that's not healthy at all. You see, the tendency of that age is to go from depending on our parents' provision to then depending on our own performance. And so when that shift in mentality happens, you go from being free and having fun, which is youth in a nutshell, to being worried and having anxiety, which sometimes looks like adulthood in a nutshell. So if you look at current stats about college students, there's an overwhelming anxiety among them. In fact, depending on which study you read, approximately 75% of college students struggle with anxiety. Now, I realize some older generations might say, well, snowflakes, they just need to toughen up. At their age, we were winning a bunch of world wars. And whereas, yeah, maybe there's some truth to that. I come from a generation of internet bloggers and social influencers. If there is a World War III, we're in trouble. But at the same time, we live in a culture that puts incredible pressure on the way you perform at a very young age. So for example, right before going to seminary, I spent the summer working at an SAT tutoring center. And I remember this one kid, he couldn't have been more than 14 years old. And yet he would tell me almost every time I saw him, he would say, I got to get into an Ivy League school. Every time. I got to go to the Ivy League. And whereas some people would applaud the ambition, I could not. That kid was 14 years old. And you could see it. He had no joy in life. Now, what makes things worse is there's evidence that among youth and young adults, the more time they spend on social media, which is so prevalent right now, but the more time they spend on there, the greater their levels of anxiety and depression. And you see, one reason for that is there is so much pressure to perform. Socially, that is. No one's really themselves on social media. It's a performance. You're staking out a certain identity on there. And so a lot of people sit under that pressure to perform. Socially, academically, career-wise, you have to perform is the message we're getting. And you see what the performance mentality almost immediately destroys is any sense of joy. So about a month ago, we had our last council meeting with Pastor Joe. And at the end, we asked him to be the one to close in prayer. Seemed fitting, right? And so someone pointed out that this would be his last prayer as our pastor, which feels like kind of a big deal. And so then another person said, kind of sensing the moment, no pressure, which it was said jokingly. And yet in every joke, there is a hint of truth, isn't there? And in this instance, it's the truth that even prayer can sometimes feel like it is a performance. In fact, I got to be honest, whenever I pray in front of people, I feel pressure. Maybe you do too. Like, what if my prayer sucks? Come on, I know you're thinking that. And yet here's what Pastor Joe said about that. He said, if you feel pressure when you're praying, I don't think you get what it's all about. In other words, prayer isn't about our performance. It's about God's provision. And the thing is, that's not just prayer. For a believer, our whole life is really a prayer. And so our life isn't about our performance. It's about God's provision. It is about the fact that we have a Father who loves us and who has promised to provide for us. And so if we almost always feel pressure in life, maybe we don't get what it's actually all about. So if we go to this gospel passage that I read at the beginning, Jesus is talking about the life that we'll live in the Spirit, and he says, just ask. 
and you will receive. Notice it is emphatically not be amazing and you will receive. No, just ask. It's that simple. And not to be misheard, this isn't saying we should just sit around and not try, but it is saying the pressure we feel doesn't come from the Lord. And so again, if you think of children, little children, they do not bank everything on their performance. It's not even in their heads to do that. No, rather they bank everything on their parents. And you see, that's a big reason they have joy. And so the work of the Spirit is to make us like children who bank everything on the goodwill of our Father. So Christ says in this passage, ask and you will receive so that, this is going to be the outcome, your joy will be full. So that's the second way the Spirit gives us joy. It's by getting us to rely on God's provision. Let's go to the third thing. If you've ever read Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, He has this one section where he's speaking primarily to people who are just about to graduate college, kind of heading out into life. And he essentially says, when you get out in life, all the current, all the things you currently think are going to make you happy, they're not going to do it. So for example, the job you thought was going to make you happy, the marriage you thought was going to make you happy, the kids, the travel, the lifestyle, whatever, you might end up getting all of that And he says, there will still be a desire that you can't kick. And so once you start realizing that, he says, you'll do one of two things. One is you will just jump from one thing to another. You'll think to yourself, I just need a better job. I need a better marriage, a better house, a better life. And so you're still convinced that your happiness is out there. And you just haven't found it. The other option is you just get cynical. You figure, nothing's ever going to satisfy me. Everything good has a downside. So I'm just going to be realistic and set my hopes kind of low. It's sort of like Debbie Downer. And so those are two very typical adult approaches to life, neither of which is very happy or hopeful. And so here's what C.S. Lewis says. He's talking about this desire we can't satisfy. And then he says, in life, every desire we have always has a corresponding way to satisfy it. Just think about it. So for example, a baby feels hunger. That's a desire. And there is such a thing as food. It'd be a weird world where we felt hunger, but there was no such thing as food. A duckling wants to swim, and there is such a thing as water. People feel sexual desire. These are his words, by the way, not mine. And there is such a thing as sex. So again, he's saying, we're not born with the desire unless there's a way to satisfy it. And so if we find in ourselves a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, what does that mean? The most probable explanation is we were made for another world. And so this is the third way the Spirit gives us joy. It's by giving us a guarantee of God's promise that the desire that we have is for Him, that the world, that this world isn't all there is. There is, in fact, another world that the Lord himself is there, and more than that, will lead us there. And so this desire we can't satisfy is meant to lead us not into pointless pursuits, nor into cynical attitudes, but into faith. You see, in Ephesians 1, it refers to the Holy Spirit as the, quote, guarantee of our inheritance. Or in other translations, it'll say that he is the, quote, down payment of our inheritance. And what that means is if and when you have the Spirit, you'll know it's true. You'll have a taste of what is coming. It's like you're a little kid on Christmas Eve who maybe gets to open a gift before going to bed. And you see, that gift is the guarantee that the next morning is going to be amazing. And so when that child goes to bed, he is in fact filled with joy. But you see, it's not because he's had his desire satisfied. It's because he knows what's coming. And so for for a believer, someone who has the Spirit, this life is, in fact, our Christmas Eve. And the Spirit is the gift that comes early and in doing so guarantees God's promise. And so we have joy. 
we pay attention to the Spirit. That is, we have joy, not because we've had our desires satisfied, but because we know morning is coming. That once we fall asleep, we'll wake up to something amazing. And that's the third way the Spirit gives us joy. It's by being the guarantee of God's promise. So just to put all three together as we wrap this up. The way the Spirit gives us joy, if we're open to it, that is, he won't force it on us, but the way he gives us joy is he brings us back into God's presence. And in God's presence, he gets us to rely on God's provision. And then he gives us a guarantee of God's promise. And in all those things, perhaps you notice the common theme. And the common theme is he makes us like children. Teenagers hide. College kids worry. Adults lose hope. But you see, children do none of those things. And so is it really a surprise that children have joy? So even though our call is to become mature in the image of Christ, Christ himself is the Son of God, child of the Father, whose way of life, whose way of life is that of a child trusting in his Father. If only that would be us. Only the Spirit can make it so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. take this time now to confess together saying the words of the Apostles Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell on the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now I invite you to join hands if you're with other people. Um, and either way, I invite you to bow your heads as we pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, God, purify the thoughts of our hearts and guide us in all things. God, we're so easily entangled in things that you hate, sometimes without even realizing it until we're thoroughly entrenched in these habits. And so God, by your grace, forgive, forgive us for that. And also set us free from that. Father, give us the courage to give up whatever is contrary to your will for us. Lord God, for your church here at CLC, we pray that you would use this time to make us stronger as a church. More focused on your call, more dependent on your spirit. And we pray this knowing that you're working. You're always working. And so God, make us attentive to that work that we might be strengthened and formed as a church in and through this time of quarantine. God, we do pray for all the churches in Santa Clarita in particular, that you would bless their ministries. In some ways, this time makes us more united, if only because we can connect online and participate in services that we normally can't. And so God, use that to unite us more fully to one another. Give us wisdom as we move forward, the churches in this valley. And God, ultimately, we pray that in the unity of your churches, more people would come to faith and see the glory of the gospel. Lord God, we pray for our schools, for teachers and students, for administrators and staff. God, it's a weird time for them, but we pray that you would again use it for good. We're thinking of our high school seniors in particular, Lord. We pray for bright futures. And more deeply, God, we pray that you would make your calling on their life more palpable and real to them. You know the plans you have for them, which is to use them for your glory. And so, God, make them humble so that you can lead them along in those plans. Father, for our families, give us grace to live together with gratitude. Give husbands and wives a renewed affection for each other. Give parents a renewed strength for their children. And God, give children a renewed honor and sense of respect for their parents. Lord God, this thinking of Memorial Day weekend, we give you thanks for those who have served in our military. And especially for those who have given their lives for the sake of our freedom and well-being. God, when we're in our right minds, we realize we live in a really great country, even with all of its problems. And so, Lord, we give you thanks for those who have made that possible. Lord Jesus, we pray to you for those who are ill. You are the great physician, and in your kingdom is total healing. And so we pray to you now for glimpses of that promise that you would begin to bring healing to all who suffer. We lift before you now the names of people about whom we worry and for whom we ask for help. So Lord, hear these names that we lift before you now, whether we say them out loud or in silence. It's into your hands, O oh Lord, that we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy and asking for your joy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, as we conclude our service and as you go out into the day, hopefully you can get outside today. Uh, But with that, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey church, we hope you will uh, be able to go out this week and just bring the joy of the Lord with you. Sing with us. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter, I will not faint. He is my shepherd, I am not afraid. And the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. He will uphold me all of my days. I am surrounded by mercy and grace. And the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of